Hey everyone, um, I guess let's go ahead and get started. I am Eric, a research biologist with Hawkwatch International. And uh, as you can see, I'm in the uh, porch of my home here in Salt Lake City, coming to you, coming to you live over WebEx to talk about golden eagle reproduction and the different factors that are associated with when eagles choose to breed um, and when their nestlings tend to do, do better and survive their, through their first year. Um, <laughs> real quick before we get going, uh, I just want to mention that I'm out here in my backyard um, and here in Salt Lake, I have a, a little flock of backyard chickens and I'm letting them have some outside time right now while I'm out here. Um, we do have some, some urban raptors. Uh, there's a Cooper's hawk that lives in the vicinity and there was recently an escaped falconry bird, uh, Harris hawk that was, that was seen just a couple blocks away. Uh, that was a while ago, but even still, if you see me jump and run away from the presentation abruptly, that's because I'm, I'm chasing away a predator uh, away from my chickens, but I don't think that that will happen. Um, just in case I want to warn everyone. Um, we're going to try to keep this pretty informal today. It is a little bit of a, a data and statistics heavy talk. However, I'm going to try to present my results in a way that you won't need to be a statistics expert to understand uh, what our findings were, uh, because it's it's really some really interesting results um, that that can tell us some good information about what we might expect for golden eagle populations in the future in the state of Utah, uh, where Hawkwatch is based and and where a lot of us live. Um, so yeah, because I want to keep this conversational and and flowing, feel free to um, add a, a question in the chat. And Nicole will just jump in and interrupt me and, and ask the question, and then we can kind of go through that as, as it happens. Um, and we should have plenty of time to get through everything I'm planning on talking about you uh, about today, and then and then have some more time for questions at the end. Um, just you know, general questions about golden eagles um, or about the the research that I'm going to present today specifically. So any questions are are great. All right, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to talk today about uh, trends in golden eagle reproduction and first year survival with uh, Steve Slater, the conservation science director uh, here at Hawkwatch, um, and Robbie Knight of the Dugway Proving Ground also um, was a co author on this paper. Um, I also want to just acknowledge Kent Keller up front. Um, he is a a very prolific golden eagle expert and nest monitoring volunteer, and he's collected uh, more nest da uh, data than anyone else in the world, it's safe to say. He's been monitoring golden eagle nests in the state of Utah since the 1970s. So that, along with uh, the Division of Wildlife and, and other uh, natural resource management agencies and, and nonprofit partners that we have here in Utah, We've combined all that data together into a really cool nest monitoring data set that we use to, to kind of answer some broad questions about how eagles are doing over a long period of time and across a, a really diverse geographic landscape. Um, well, let's get started. So we're gonna be looking at nest monitoring uh, data today. And like I said, we have a lot of, of data um, going back um, to the 70s, but but primarily my analysis is going to focus on from 2010 to the present and, and from 2000 to the present as well. We also have data on jackrabbit abundance, which is the primary prey item that golden eagles eat here in Utah, um, black-tailed jackrabbits. And we have good data on that going from 2011 to the present. And we also uh, do a lot of telemetry, as some of you may know. Um, some of you have probably had the chance to come out with us in the field. Uh, or maybe saw a recent story map that I put together about uh, golden eagle telemetry, where we we go into the nest and we'll uh, place a transmitter on on the back of that young eagle, uh, and then the eagle will fly around and, and do what it does, and and that allows us to um, to tell where they're going and what types of habitat they're using, and then also if if they die, we can go out and we can collect them and we can bring you know get our transmitter back and we can we can take a look at at the remains of the eagle in order to determine how that eagle died and then that can tell us a lot about the the conservation threats that these the species is facing and, and what might be the barriers to those eagles 
getting through their first year of life because that can be a really tough time for a lot of wild wild animals and eagles in particular. And oh yeah, and we're gonna be focusing on the western half of the state of Utah. Um, a lot of our data from the Utah military operating area. So that's a that's a big area in the western half of the state where the Department of Defense um, controls the airspace, they use it for training and testing purposes, and they have a natural resource management mandate across that area. And so that's that's part of the reason that they've helped fund this research. Uh, so as some of you may know, we're we're undergoing landscape changes here in Utah, just like most of the rest of the world, um, we're seeing reduced precipitation, particularly in the summer times. Um, precipitation in the winter isn't changing quite as bad, but it, it looks like it is becoming more concentrated in, in uh, fewer and fewer storm events. Um, and we're also seeing increased temperatures. So we're already a desert, a uh, hot and dry state. So we're kind of, we're trending more in that direction. So those are some of the factors that we're gonna look at. Uh, related to golden eagle reproduction, and the other, um, the other one of the other big threats that we face here is um, invasive species, and and one of the most problematic invasives is cheatgrass, which you can see in the background of this slide. It's an invasive annual grassland, and and basically what happened is as this climate becomes drier and the communities change we're seeing increased wildfire. Um, and and this, this cheatgrass invasion is reducing biodiversity along vast areas of the Great Basin. It's an annual forb, so it grows, every, it re-sprouts every spring, and it spreads rapidly. It's, it's most invasive in valleys below 6,000 feet elevation, and it tends to reduce shrub cover and biodiversity. Um, which is not good for golden eagle prey communities uh, like the jackrabbits that I mentioned. Jackrabbits really like to shrub habitat where they can have cover um, and, and cheatgrass doesn't provide that for them. Uh, the way that this works is um, these plant communities are, um, are disrupted by increased wildfire frequency that, that comes as a result of cheatgrass, but it also helps spread the cheatgrass more. And of course, the drier climate um, cheatgrass, um, which makes the range more susceptible to fire earlier in the year before the native forbs have even produced their seed. Um, and in some cases, uh, researchers have found that the fire interval, so the time in between when an area burns naturally and when it regrows and then burns again, um, in a mature sagebrush habitat, that interval might be 60 to over 100 years in between wildfires in a, in a sagebrush dominated system. But under cheatgrass dominance, we're seeing fire return intervals of, of five years or less. So it really, it really affects the landscape because once you have multiple burn cycles of cheatgrass, the native shrubs are, are really destroyed and, and the cheatgrass comes back every single year and just keeps knocking those shrubs down a little bit more and more every time it turns uh, before it can recover. Um, so all in all, we're seeing a, a pretty widespread loss of, um, of foraging habitat for eagles and a loss of biodiversity in, in some of these, these sagebrush landscapes. Um, but how is that related to breeding decline? We're seeing golden eagles. <laughs> this is the first graph I'm gonna show you. I'll, I'll try not to, uh, uh, I'll try to explain these as well as I can, um, each graph. So on the bottom horizontal axis of this, we have time a year from 1976 when, you know, that was Kent Keller's monitoring data started all the way up through uh, 2019, I believe is on this, this graph. And you can see the blue and red lines represent the percentage of breeding and occupied golden eagle territories that we checked or that were checked by volunteers and our, and our partners. Um, so you can see occupancy and breeding was doing pretty well. Uh, it was quite high up until the early mid nineties. And then it really dropped off and it's kind of been at a little bit of a lower level since then with a gradual, looks like a gradual decline um, in uh, nest use. So, so the initiation of nesting, laying of eggs, um, breeding by eagles during the time period. But what's causing this? There's a lot of things that could be. Um, there's a lot of uh, different 
challenges throughout their life cycle that eagles will face, and, and not really all organisms. And what we call it when um, an animal um, goes from, from being born to being recruited into the breeding population, that's, that's a process of recruitment. So uh, a young eagle going from a hatchling to, in, in an eagle's case, it, it's five years before they're, they're a full adult and, and able to breed and then add more eagles to that population. So all the steps along that, along that time are, are hurdles that an eagle will have to pass over in order to become a sustaining member of the population that, that can, can add more eagles. So uh, the main steps are, are nest initiation. So do eagles actually choose to breed? They don't breed every single year. They only will breed when the prey conditions and the habitat conditions are, are good in their nest territory. Um, and certain territories where the habitat's really good, we see breeding every single year uh, when we're out there uh, nest monitoring in the spring. Other territories aren't active, they, aren't, they don't lay eggs as often in those territories because the prey and the habitat isn't quite as good. Um, and the eggs have to hatch, so the eagles need to spend uh, enough time at the nest to protect those eggs and incubate them. Um, the young eagles have to survive the nestling period um, and, and actually fledge and leave the nest. Then they have to go through what we call dispersal, which is the process of, um, of surviving from when they first leave the nest to when they're ready to, to leave their, their natal territory and go off and explore the world on their own. Uh, in some cases, that can be pretty fast. Uh, it could be as little as two months after they fly, they can be making long you know, almost migratory type flights. Um, and in some cases it can be much longer. We actually like it when we see our transmitted eagles that take a long time to disperse because those ones tend to do a lot better. Um, longer dispersal time, so spending longer close to the nest before they leave to find their own territory, that tends to be associated with better habitat and higher survival rates. Um, and then, of course, the juveniles have to survive long enough to to become adults and and to find their own territory so that they can become part of the breeding population. So today, we're going to just focus on the two uh, aspects of that that we. Which is, as I said, the decision of eagles to breed. And juvenile survival, so driving from. That, that time of leaving the nest to the first year of life. And so we're gonna be looking at the habitat and the climate factors that are associated with two, those two um, stages. So what data do we have available to kind of look at these questions? Well, we have some rabbit density surveys that we've conducted along with the Division of Wildlife and, and DOD partners. Uh, this is a little black-tailed jackrabbit over here on the right side, um, you get the, the preferred prey. Of, uh, of golden eagles. We have nine years of consistent coverage in the West Desert. Um, so it's starting to get a, a, to be a better and better data set. Um, as you may know, and as I'll get into later, jackrabbit populations tend to cycle. And so having a long uh, extended monitoring period for our data set allows us to uh, determine what effect that has that density of rabbits has on eagle reproduction both at when their rabbits are at a low level and when they're at a high level as well um we also have 67 um this isn't current we have even more we probably have around 80 now gps transmitters and this is a this is a microwave telemetry gps unit on the back of a, a golden eagle uh looks like about a seven and a half week old eagle that we took from the nest and, and attached that transmitter on there. You can see the antenna that it uses to link up to the satellite. Uh, you can see the solar panel that it uses to, um, to power the unit. And, and these units can last uh, quite a long time. You know, that we've, we have a few that are still online from 2013. Uh, so really great data sets we have from those birds. Uh, and then this eagle, as we were putting the transmitter onto it, um, we, we have a hood over its head just to to make sure that he's he's calm and comfortable and, and we can get a proper fit for the transmitter harness. It it holds on like a backpack. Um and yeah, happy to answer questions about that process um at the end or or during. Um 
And we, we've done that with, with support from the Freedman Ground again and, and from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Western Golden Eagle team, um, as well as the U.S. Forest Service. We also have a really big nest monitoring data set from over a thousand territories. Uh, and this is this is what I'll mainly be talking about today. Uh, it's to me, it's it's a really cool opportunity to look at this kind of big data of ecology where we can just see some some broad trends, hopefully, by looking at a really broad scale all across the state and through a long period of time. Here's uh, one of our field technicians using a scope to monitor a nest on a faraway cliff. And as you can see, um, sometimes we like to take our dogs out with us when we do that, <laughs> but we're trying to uh, just minimize the disturbance as we're viewing that nest uh, using a scope from, from viewing it as far away as possible. So let's get into the jackrabbit data first. Uh, here's another graph. Um, the different lines represent different study areas where we were able to find jackrabbit data. And it doesn't really matter what those acronyms stand for. You just just need to know that the different colors represent different study areas in the state of Utah and in southern Idaho. Um, and then the vertical axis, of course, is, is density of jackrabbits, so jacks per square kilometer. And then the horizontal axis is time. And what you can see from this is um, the, the rabbit densities, they seem to cycle consistently. They seem to vary across the state and across our study region. They seem to vary together um, through time. So there's these, these peaks and these valleys. Um, again, a lot of this data hasn't been collected recently. So um, it's, you know, the data set could be better, but it is what it is. We have what we have. So we'll see what we can get. And we do have consistently collected data for the state of Utah for a recent period. That's what we'll be looking at next. So we have about one full cycle. And here we have the jackrabbit trends for the state. And in these different lines here, again, they're, they're jackrabbit numbers essentially through time. And the different lines here are different partners who have done the different studies. And they had slightly different methods, but they all found the same trend. So we're relatively confident that, that this is what's happening throughout this period of time with, with our jackrabbit numbers. They um, began. And then gradually increased to a peak in, in 2015 and then fell back off. Um, the reason for this cycle aren't really widely understood. Um, it can have to do with disease and, and we are seeing um, rabbit hemorrhagic disease spreading in Utah now, unfortunately. Um, so we may see these numbers go down even more just because that's a new, a new threat that they deal with. Um, but the, the reason for these, these peaks and declines aren't, aren't well understood, unfortunately. But what we do also have is, is Golden Eagle juvenile survival data. So again, this comes from the transmitters. Let's take a look. So again, we're looking at the jackrabbit density in blue, and we're looking at the percent eagles that survive their first year in red. And this is, it's ecological data. The sample size isn't huge, so it's a little messy. But to me, it seems like there's a relationship there where Ego survival seems to do a little bit better when there's more prey available, uh, which is, it makes sense. That goes along with our understanding of, of what they need to survive and what, and what they do on the landscape. And if you think about it, a young eagle is learning to fly, they're learning to hunt, they're learning new territories. Um, it's a challenging time. And so the more density of prey that's available to them, the higher their chances of surviving that first year. And this had a correlation of 0.41. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. It's not a great correlation, but it's okay for ecology. This is a more interesting comparison to me. If you look at the territories in use in green, that's, so that's the percentage of territories that we checked where golden eagles actually laid eggs. That percentage tracks those jack numbers pretty closely. So again, jackrabbits are in blue and territories in use are in green. And it, it tracks it pretty close. You can see there's a little bit of a lag with that peak in uh, 2017, just a year or two behind the peak of jackrabbit numbers. Um, but these eagles are responding to the jackrabbits. And, and as those populations of their prey increases, 
they're they're able to to lay more eggs. And that had a really good correlation on um, point three. That's that's very high for ecological data. But remember, if you look back at this graph of, of rabbit data through time, we're not seeing these big peaks anymore. We're not seeing like if you look at the latest peak and trace that blue line back and kind of imagine what it might have been doing was that peak in 1970s and then and then the peak in 1982 were just a lot higher than the peaks that we're seeing now. So so what's going on with that? And what's what's causing it? And one thing that we think might be related to that is is that that landscape change that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and unfortunately, it's really hard to scientifically argue for a trend because there's so much missing data. Um, and then we're also seeing, like I said before, that gradual breeding decline from high levels in the 70s and 80s down to lower levels today. Um, and although the, like I said, the driver for those peaks and valleys of, of rabbit population aren't well understood, what I wanna do is take a look at the habitat and climate characteristics around all those nest sites that might be affecting um, the overall abundance of jackrabbits and then therefore the breeding response of golden eagles. So we'll get into the nest monitoring data set a little bit. Um, we compiled all this monitoring data from our own records, uh, partners in Dugway, the US Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, um, Division of Wildlife Resources, uh, RINS, another nonprofit that does uh, raptor monitoring here in Utah, and of course, uh, superstar volunteer Kent Keller. Um, and we combined all that data into um, over 5,000 records uh, from over 1,000 territories. So a record being a status. It did Golden Eagles breed at that territory in a given year, or did they not? Now, some of these territories, we only have a year or two of data, but other ones we have in you know, a long period of time that they've been monitored for. Um, but we're able to, um, using GIS and statistics, combine all of that data into one and, and use it to, to look at the overall trends. Um, I really like this hey, picture. Eric, we, we, have a a oh, we have a few questions if you wanna take okay. a quick look. Yeah, great. Um, Eric was curious whether your eagle surveys or nest surveys are done in the evening um, to deal with eye shine. If that means the reflection of the sun on the scope, or uh, I'm not sure what what the um, what the viewer means by eye shine, but we we typically do our our nest monitoring. So oh, sorry about that. It looks like he was curious about the um, jack rabbits. It seems like not oh, the eagles. Yeah. So there's a couple different methodologies. Um, the the Division of Wildlife, I believe, does spotlighting surveys, so they'll drive a truck down a road and, and shine a light and look for eye shine. Um, and then the the methodology that we use um, and that our, our DOD partners use is um, a walking transect, and we'll actually do them during the middle of the day when the jackrabbits are, are in cover. And what you do is you basically go out and you walk in a big square um, that's, you know, a, thousand meters on each side and you count how many jacks you see and then based on how close those jacks are when they flush away from you and, and how many you see we're able to calculate a density um, based on that and and we do it during the day when uh and it's just just kind of done visually so it does involve a lot of walking if you're interested if anyone is lives in utah that's that's watching this and is interested in volunteering um and helping us perform some of those surveys we do them in may every year and uh we love to get help from volunteers with that. So, uh, yeah, any other, I hope that answered that. Uh, any other questions, Nicole? Yeah, we do have a few. Um, Jody sure. was actually curious uh, what some of the most common causes of mortality are for young eagles, whether it's oh, good uh, question. Lack of food or a combination of things. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so, so a lot of it is um, malnutrition, starvation. That's probably the most common. Um, but we do unfortunately see a lot of, of human caused mortality as well. Um, big problems are electrocution, um, vehicle strikes, which actually kind of spun off into another Hawkwatch project, um, the Eagle Vehicle Strike Project, which you can read about on our website. Um, 
as well as um, shooting, unfortunately, and, and lead poisoning. Um, when eagles eat ground squirrels that uh, have been shot or, or feed on um, big game gut piles that are left behind by hunters, they'll, they'll be susceptible to lead poisoning. So it's a variety of things. Uh, the most common is that, that starvation, malnutrition. Um, it's, it's not necessarily, it's hard to, it's hard to tie that to humans. Um, but I mean, when you look at climate change and, and habitat loss and fire regimes changing from invasive species, I mean, the, the reduction in prey densities may be related to human activities as, as well. So I don't want to put too much stock in that. Um, that is. Mostly it's, it's, uh, I'd say it's about half and half natural causes versus anthro, uh, human causes mortalities. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, looks yeah, like the that, last one we have for right now. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, looks like the last one we have for right now is, um, Isabella was curious what SRBP is. Hmm. National conservation area in Southern Idaho. A lot of good um, raptor research comes out of there. Um, a lot of the folks at Boise State uh, have done research up there. There's a, a lot of greater research coming out of that area. Any others? I think that's it for now, but um, so you can keep going, but definitely okay. everyone feel free to ask questions in the chat or put them in the Q&A. Oh, it looks like we had one just come in. Okay. Um, Let's see, someone said that they're working with Dr. Charles Preston in Wyoming on a film about golden eagles and oh, your great. methods seem very similar to his work. Do you ever work with outside film production companies to help document? Um, no, but we'd love to. <laughs> um, yeah, we, uh, we are happy to accommodate um, film production companies and media uh, in the field with us. It's a great way to get the word out about the work that we do. Um, so. If you have a connection with a group like that, um, that might be interested in, in coming out with us in the field, um, we'd love to chat with you um, after the talk, or or you can get a hold of Nicole and, and she can can help coordinate that. Great. And then uh, Steve Slater, who you know quite well, said that it, we actually uh, have yes. uh, a piece that that same person filmed in the Cody Museum. So it looks like we might already have a connection. Oh, okay, great. Thanks for the reminder there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where are we at here? I'm gonna collect my notes. Um... So we have about we have 5,800 territory status records. So that's did eagles breed or, or did not in a territory and from a thousand territories. So we have about an average of five, five years of data for each territory all across the state. And we've got, I'll just go back right one slide for, for a second. I love this picture. It shows two golden eagle adults looking into their nest bowl at, I think it's like a two day old chick. And this this photo came from a Nest camera that um, that we installed as part of Dustin Maloney's um, master's project on, on golden eagles and and nest parasites and, and contaminants. Um, some of you may have attended his uh, his talk that he gave the other week, um, but I just love that photo of the two um, proud parents looking down on their their little nestling there. Uh, anyway, so going back to our data set. We have data from the Great Basin on the western half of the state. That's a basin and range environment uh, leading all the way from the Wasatch Front over to the Nevada border. Um, I don't know if some of you have, have visited our Go Shoots Migration Count site, but that's a, a great example of that type of landscape, just to imagine it, uh, if you haven't been out in that area. Um, and then we have a lot of data from the Colorado Plateau as well, which is sort of like that cliffs and canyons, eastern half of the state. And then, of course, we have mountainous regions, um, which we combined it from the center of the state. And when we did this analysis, we, we looked at, at how these different climate and environmental factors are affecting 
whether or not eagles are choosing to breed. And we looked at them all together across the whole state. And then we looked at them separately as well across these different eco regions, just to see if some of those factors might have more of an effect or less of an effect in different parts of the state. So we did what we what statisticians and, and biologists like to call creating a model. And our model is trying to predict and explain variation in nest initiation. So whether they lay eggs, and where they do that, and why. And this is a great picture from Neil Paprocki, I believe, a former hawk watch biologist of of like maybe a six week old eagle nestling. And and that one I think was taken in our eagle vehicle strikes that we are. All right. So I'm not going to get into the methods too much because it's super boring and we're already very graph and data heavy in this talk. So and essentially what I wanted to communicate from this slide is just the different things that we looked at. We looked at all these different factors about the nest site. And in some cases, they were different from year to year because remember, we have multiple years of data from some of these sites. Uh, we looked at the elevation of the nest site, latitude, how close it was to water, the previous winter before the spring breeding season, how much precipitation was there and how warm or cold was it? And then we looked at the land cover, so the, the vegetative communities around the territory, what percentage of that was, was good shrub habitat. We looked at the history of fire in the territory, and then we looked at the ecoregion as well. So that's, you know, these three different, different zones across the state that we, you know, we thought might have a little bit different performance. For some of these these variables that we looked at and i'm gonna not talk too much about this slide because it's technical um but essentially what i do want to say about it is we found that um shrub habitat so having intact shrub cover a uh, higher percentage of shrub cover was very important for eagles and we found uh significant effects of the history of fire, as well as winter temperature and winter precipitation. And I'm going to focus on, and then of course, and that was a little bit different in, in between two of the different study areas. So the GE, the Great Basin, um, we saw some different effects than we saw in the Colorado Plateau. Um, so I'll just go into some of that a little bit here, mainly focusing on the history of fire, the cumulative Um, and again, just going to gloss through this quickly because we don't want to, you know, if if your eyes are glazing over, this talk will be recorded and you can watch it tonight when you're trying to fall asleep. Um, anyway, we'll just talk about this burned area because this goes along with the story that um, that we told at the beginning about about cheatgrass invasion and, and shrub loss. So the thing to look at in this slide is the value from our model is much higher or a little bit higher in the Colorado Plateau versus in the Great Basin. So this predictor, this variable, the history of fire performed differently between those two areas. And it's a lot easier to see when you look at it graphically like this. So just to explain this graph, we have a green line that represents the Colorado Plateau, the nesting territories we've got there. And we have a purple line that represents our Great Basin study area. Now, on the vertical axis, we have the probability of use. So that is, did eagles nest in their territory? Um, did lay eggs? And then on the horizontal axis, we have the percentage of burned area within that nest territory. Um, and the reason that this can actually go above 100 is because territories can burn more than once. And so in the history of the data set, some areas were completely burned over and then grew back and then burned again. And so those areas would have a value of higher than 100%. Um, the way that we calculated it, we decided to, to factor that in because we thought that rep, uh, repeated burning is going to be more destructive potentially than, than individual burning. So what do we see here? We see fire, more fire in the Colorado Plateau, so the green area, is actually associated with more use of nests. That seems weird. That's opposite of what I told you before. That doesn't make any sense. In the Great Basin, we see more fire associated with less nesting, and that goes along with that story. So, so what's going on? When I first found this result, I was confused. I was frustrated. I wasn't sure what was going on, and and I 
I had to think about it a little bit, but I looked back at our data set and I think I figured out what's going on. And what we're seeing is an effect of this region in our green data, our Colorado Plateau data, all these nests came from one specific data source and that's the Manti LaSalle National Forest. So these nests tended to be a little bit different than the nests in the Great Basin and, and, and even some of the nests, other nests in the Colorado Plateau that are more spread out throughout the rest of the area. Um, so again, in this, in this green area, the Colorado Plateau, we see more fire in the territory, more history of fire leads to more nesting, which is the opposite, it's counterintuitive to that cheatgrass story I told you. But when you look at these nests, they are a lot higher in elevation. This is a typical nest territory from that, that data set where I had the little box around it. Um, it's, it's got pinion juniper forests around it, higher up in elevation, there's aspen glades. Um, and, and imagine what the effect of fire is gonna be in this type of environment. It's not gonna be that, that degrading, shrub destroying, cheatgrass cycle fire. It's gonna potentially open up the habitat. And this is, so this is potentially what is causing that, that increased nesting response um, in reaction to, to that fire. Um, this is actually consistent with what some researchers in Europe have shown about golden eagles. Um, where they've seen that they actually respond positively to clear cutting in some cases, which, which, you know, it doesn't make any sense. You're like, oh, clear cutting is destructive. But for the golden eagle, they're they're pretty versatile in the types of habitat that they can they can live in and they can survive and reproduce. Um, but they prefer to be in open areas where they can take advantage of their their soaring flight and their great vision to be able to or even just hunting from a perch and see vast areas. So the more open that habitat is to a certain extent, the better it might be for foraging. So compare this uh, image of this territory. And I don't know, you can, we took this photo so that we could relocate one of the nests and there's probably a nest in the back on those cliffs. Um, it's, it's too hard to see in this one. Uh, if you zoom down, you, can, you might be able to see it, but um, anyway, that's a typical great base or yeah, great basin nest territory in our data set. Um, obviously, eagles nest throughout the Great Basin and in, in areas that look a lot different than this. But in our data, this is where most of it comes from, is, is nest territories like this. And then compare well, sorry, I was saying Great Basin, but I meant Colorado Plateau. This is our Colorado Plateau. <laughs> this is our Colorado Plateau sample. This is our Great Basin sample. This is a lot different landscape, right? This is a shrubby area. You can see the, the valley bottom is probably grassland. When a fire rips through this territory, this is gonna be a lot more susceptible to cheatgrass because it's lower in elevation. Um, and, and this is this is typically the areas that we're seeing more cheatgrass invasion. Um, so fire is gonna have a really different effect in this ecosystem. It's already very open. So that degradation of the vegetation and the loss of shrub cover, um, we think is driving lower reproductive rates in territories with less shrub and with more history of fire. Um, that's about all I kind of want to focus on today. I mean, obviously this data set is huge and it's incredibly detailed and we, um, there's a lot that we can do with it. Um, if you're interested in learning more about it or, or more details about the, the process of the analysis that I went through or, or some, other, some of the other questions that we looked at, um, yeah, I'm happy to answer uh, your questions now, or you can welcome to email me individually. Um, I want to thank our, our partners on this, Dugway Proving Ground, the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, Volunteer Kent Keller, Forest Service, ELM, the Western Golden Eagle Team from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the other data contributors that, that made this analysis possible. Um, and that's about all I got for you now. Um, yeah, we're at 12.42 here, so I've got some time left to answer questions. Um, and uh, yeah, Nicole, any any questions from the chat? Yeah, um, so Carrie was wondering what the average lifespan uh, of a golden eagle is and how many uh, eggs are in their clutch generally. Sure, that's a great question. Um, the lifespan, they've been known to live over 20 years. Um, typically in the wild, it's shorter than that. Um, in their clutch, 
they can have anywhere between one and three eggs. And a lot of times what will happen is the number of eggs that they lay uh, corresponds with the amount of prey that's available. So in those really good years when they're, a lot of the nests are active, another thing that we can look at to, to gauge their reproductive success and, and their, um, that territory's contribution to the population in the area is, is how many eggs and how many nestlings actually survive. Um, mostly we'll see two in, uh, in areas where there's good prey. Um, we'll see two nestlings, two eggs. Very rarely we'll see three, and that's uncommon. And, and even when uh, there's three, a lot of times um, not all the nestlings will, will make it to maturity and, and fledge. Um, and then in lower years, when there's less prey available, um, they'll kind of dial it back and, and typically have only one egg, uh, or, or they'll only be able to raise one uh, nestling to maturity. Great. Um, David is curious what month is best for hatchlings in uh, the study area that you're doing, so here in kind of the Utah region. Sure. Um, I... That's a good question. I think we could look at that with our with our transmitter data and look at like hatch date and correspond that with the first year survival. And I don't know if we've looked at the data in that way. And so I'm 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 curious about that. I think that's a good question. Um, earlier, I think tends to be a little bit better um, because they can they can get out and they can um, get out of the nest before the really, really hot part of the summer. We see some nestlings that really don't do well uh, if they're, if the eggs are laid too late, um, it can get really hot and those nestlings can just cook on the nest. Um, they can get pretty dehydrated and, and not do as well because of that. Um, generally, we see a pretty broad range of, of nest initiation dates in our study area. Um, most eagles begin nesting anywhere from late February to um, even into April, some of the last pairs are laying eggs, but mostly the laying is done by April. And then there's about a 40 day incubation period and then about a nine week um, nestling period. So they'll fledge anywhere from late June, um, mid June is kind of when they, when they're fledging, that's when we're doing our transmitter work. Great. The next question we have is when uh, doing monitoring, are any of the birds checked for their health or any health conditions? Yeah, we do. Um, and and that's, um, <laughs> that's more the subject of uh, my colleague Dustin's research. Um, he can speak about that better than I can. So I, I believe that presentation that he gave is is recorded and, and you can can view that um we will when we whenever we band or transmit a nestling we'll um, assess it for uh parasite levels and just kind of looking at um ectoparasites so lice or um any kind of arachnid or insect that's that's burrowed into the eagle around their face or um under their wings uh, under their feathers and we'll also take blood samples um, from the nestlings to look at contaminant levels um, and then also blood parasites that, that might, be, might be in there. And we'll also, of course, we'll, we'll take their weight. That's a big indicator of how well they're going to do is just how heavy they are. Um, the heavier they are, the more muscle they've been able to put on from while they're sitting in the nest and growing. And, um, the healthier, yeah, just the more prey they're getting, the better the habitat around their nest, um, the, the heavier that nestling is going to be. And, and that's what we like to see is big, chunky nestlings. Like this one in the picture here is, that one looks pretty healthy, healthy eight-week-old, seven-week-old nestling. That one's getting ready to fledge pretty soon. He's about a little bit older than we'd like for the transmitter. Um, when we go in to do the transmitters, it's kind of a balance because we want them to be as big as possible um, <laughs> so that the transmitter harness fits properly. But if they're too big, then they can they can try to fly and get away, and and we don't want that. 
Thanks, Eric. Uh, our yeah. next question is Lori is from Lori, and uh, they're curious whether 2020 was a good year for eagle reproduction. Uh, no, uh, it was not. Unfortunately, we saw a very small percentage of the territories that we checked were in use, and we had a lot of nest failures. So nests where eagles started, uh, they laid their eggs, they incubated, but they couldn't get quite the prey they needed and the adults weren't able to spend enough time. Uh, so the nestlings didn't make it. Unfortunately, we saw quite a bit of that this year. Um, we do think the rabbit numbers are starting to come up a little bit though. So hopefully next year, if the rabbit hemorrhagic disease doesn't strike too hard, that we could see, uh, yeah, just an increase um, as a result of that natural cycling in the population. Thanks, Eric. Uh, our next question is uh, COVID related, and someone sure. was curious uh, whether uh, that it's, it's a little early, but whether there have been any studies um, done on any impact from COVID on the eagles, um, Birds, just as far as increased yeah. traffic, um, recreation, things like that. Oh, sure. No, I, I was thinking like, can they catch COVID? And um, that's a great question. I, um, and it's it's certainly possible. Um, a lot of the nests that we study are in some very remote areas that even even in COVID times don't see a lot of recreational traffic. Um, but yeah, we we do. That is something that that is interesting to keep a watch on, just because recreation in the West Desert and OHV use and and, and all that kind of stuff. It, it is increasing through the years. And so these areas that people are not visiting now may become, uh, you know, sanctuaries of solitude in the future as the closer and closer areas get filled up with, with people who want to recreate. So um, just uh, something you definitely want to keep an eye on in the future. Our next question is actually uh, two people had the same one, and they were curious what the most common prey items that you find and what the most unusual you found in a nest. Oh, man, um, I've seen like I found little baby antelope feet. That's a cool one. And then uh, <laughs> we find snakes some in there sometimes, especially when when the prey, when the jackrabbits aren't available. Um, yeah, black tailed jackrabbits are, are definitely the most common. Uh, especially in the charge in higher elevation areas they'll eat marmots um, they'll really eat anything that they can find um, i was out in i was out hiking in um in city creek canyon this year and watched a golden eagle make like an attack flight against a group of mule deer which was pretty crazy like i don't i don't think an eagle can uh could take a mule deer down of course but i mean maybe a fawn or Maybe they could go for the eyes or something, but uh, they're pretty aggressive predators and they will they will attack anything that they think they can eat. Thankfully, not us. Um, <laughs> one question that I'm surprised we haven't gotten is, I guess I haven't focused too much on the nest entry aspect, but people always ask me, what, are the, what does the mother do when you go into the nest to, to band or get through the transmitter? And, and, and fortunately for us, um, eagles will, will actually leave the nest alone. Uh, and, and if you're in there, they won't come back. And I think part of the reason for that is it's it's an adaptive strategy that, that they've evolved into because there are such low survival rates for, for nestlings and it takes so long. There's so many hurdles to jump through for an eagle to go from a, a hatchling that an adult might protect to a fully adult eagle that's gonna pass along the genes of that adult. It's almost makes more sense for the adult eagle rather than protecting its nestling um, it's already gone through that ringer. So if it can survive and and live to breed another year, then maybe that's, you know, the more the more ecologically beneficial thing for that bird to do, uh, or evolutionarily beneficial, I should say. Uh, anyway, <laughs> that's a little off topic, but yeah, any more questions? Yeah, uh, Tana was curious whether there are Eagles always use the same nests, whether they take over existing ones or whether they will build new ones on occasion. Yeah, they definitely do. Um, and they can build a big stick nest in a relatively short amount of time. Like I've seen um, an eagle nest that I've known and, and visited a few different times and 
and I, I saw it collapse in one year because they get so big and the ad sticks onto it that sometimes they collapse under their own weight and fall off the cliff. But then they'll just build them back up and, and they'll, you know, even within a couple of weeks, they can build a, a big stick nest. Um, in each territory, uh, eagles maintain multiple alternate nest sites and they'll only use uh, one, obviously, you know, to lay their eggs in a given season and they'll focus their attention on that one. But they do also maintain sometimes up to six or seven uh, nests within their territory and defend that whole area away from from other eagles. Thanks, Eric. Um, we've had uh, they're not necessarily questions, but we've had a few people that were curious about either ways that they can get involved or perhaps ways to do similar work like uh, you're doing in the field. Um, do you want to share your information in case anyone wants to get in touch or ask you more questions? Absolutely. Uh, I will add my email to the chat. And anyone that is still on there can um, can feel free to send more questions. Um, just typing it in here. Eshabo at hawkwatch.org. Yeah, just Grab that email and uh, and feel free to to contact me um, with any more questions or, or uh, inquiries about how you can get involved or or anything like that. Um, yeah. And we actually had one more question come in. Sure. Um, Timothy was curious when the eagles will leave the nest when you are uh, maybe repelling in or visiting. Are there ever mm -hmm. times when they don't go back? Oh, so yeah, typically like like we call that a jumper. Um, when we repel in, we're going at a, a time we're, we're pretty careful about monitoring nests and, and going in when the eagles are just the right age. So they're, if they can fly, they usually can't fly very well and they've never flown before. So they'll, they'll get scared, jump out of the nest, um, and typically like glide slash flap their way down to the ground. And then we'll just repel to the ground and grab them and then do what we need to do and, and put them back. So it's it's typically it's generally not a huge problem when that happens, but but we do want to avoid it just because it's it's more of a disturbance on them. It's a little more of a risk. So um, and are there ever times where adults will abandon a nest that you visited? Um, they they generally always come back, correct? Yes. Um, it's when we do see nest abandonment. Um, it's generally earlier on in the breeding cycle. So when, uh, you know, courtship period or early incubation, they haven't put that much energy into that, um, that egg, that reproductive attempt yet. So they're not as attached to it. By the time the eagles, the uh, nestlings are seven weeks old or eight weeks when we're going in to, to do our transmitter work, that that nestling is very close to um, to the age when it's going to fledge, and and so the adult has invested a ton of of energy in, into that offspring, and and they will come back. So we've even seen them come back and bring prey, like while we're still in the nest. One one cool thing that they sometimes do, um, we kind of we're hypothesizing that this is like a predator distraction tactic, is they'll sometimes bring a jackrabbit and just drop it next to the nest, like away from the nest a little ways. And I, I don't know, I, mean, I think that could be a strategy they use to, um, I've seen it more than once. Uh, it could be a strategy that they use to distract like some kind of predator that's looking for an easy meal. Cause these little nestlings, these, these fledglings are pretty feisty. And if I were a coyote that had somehow been able to scramble into an eagle nest, I would really rather go after a dead jackrabbit than a feisty little eagle nest. Thanks, Eric. Uh, looks like those are all our questions for now. Um, so unless anyone has any more, I think we can wrap up. All right, great. Well, thanks everyone. Um, and, and thanks for supporting Hawkwatch. Um, I see people are, are starting to drop out. So thanks for everyone who stuck around to the very end. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to tell you about some of the, the stuff that I'm working on and, uh, and a little bit of what I know about Golden Eagles.